you want to turn to it. I am going to. I know that it's you know two weeks before we, we celebrate Christmas, and probably you're expecting like you know the four you know faith, hope, joy, love, peace, or some type of, of four sermons on that. Um, and we haven't been doing that, and, and there's a reason. There's a good reason um, for doing that. Today's scripture text and where we're headed today might be the oddest of them all, and yet I hope that by the time we're done, maybe it gives some new, fresh perspective on the season that we're trying to head into, okay? And as I had um, a, a friend and I had a discussion, you know, Jesus wasn't actually born on December 25th, whether people know that or not, I don't know, um, but more likely in the spring, right? And we, we know that for certain reasons that I won't bore you with now. Um, but nonetheless, it's not December 25th, and yet it's a time that we come together and we at least recognize and say this, we're gonna at least hold it in our hearts that and celebrate in this time, for whatever reasons that the tradition has developed, which I know why, but again, I won't bore you with, we are gonna celebrate the fact that the king came in, that the king brought the kingdom and it's ushered in it. You know our vision here, any week is about a good enough week to celebrate that. In my opinion, that's Christmas every single Saturday or Sunday or weekend or day. Because every single day, we need to be cognizant of the fact that the king has come and he's come for his people. Every single week. So I am actually going to go to Revelation on the Sunday before Christmas Sunday. Revelation 20, okay? Verses 7 through 10. If you have a Bible, feel free to open up. And if you don't, just listen. Listen, it's going to be one of the weirdest sermons, probably, or scriptures anyways, that you'll hear on the Sunday before Christmas Sunday. And when the 10,000 years are ended, right? This is John's vision of, of the final battle. Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. There's going to be a final epic battle. And the forces of evil will look like sand on the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Doesn't sound like very Merry Christmas just yet, right? But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The beast, the false prophet, Satan himself, the devil, that old serpent, thrown into the lake of fire. We are talking about the end battle when all evil will be eradicated. Why on earth am I preaching that on December, what's today, December what, 15th? Why am I preaching that Armageddon battle on December 15th? Well, there's a few reasons, and I'm going to get into them one at a time, but the first thing I want to do is I want to tell you a little story about me when I was younger, okay? Not, not so much younger, but definitely back a little bit. And, and I thought, like, I remember thinking about those who went into the military, because I had some loved ones that went into the military, right? And I remember thinking, oh, this is gonna be a really good option for them. They're gonna have the GI Bill, right? And they're gonna be able to go to college. And they're gonna have, I think it's the GI Bill, right? That helps pay for college. Like, what a, what a blessing this is gonna be. Even though, and I can remember being little and thinking, oh, well, what if there's a battle? What if, what if there's a battle? Like, oh man, and you know, as you get older, you understand it more and more. But when you're little, right? I think if we're all honest, the thought of battle, the thought of war is scary to us no matter what age we are. But when you're little, all I can think of is the person I love so much. I hope nothing happens to them. I hope that they're able to go and I hope they have, that this opens many doors for them and it seemed like the right thing. But I was like nervous for this person, right? And, and that, you know, I can remember being in college and how many have seen the movie Braveheart? Okay. I, I was really, for whatever reason, into that movie. And there's this, there's this amazing scene, and I remember all the fears that I have. I remember seeing this one spot in this movie and going, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I, I promise you there's a spiritual point that will tie to Revelation and a spiritual point that hopefully ties to the, the season that we're celebrating. But you got to hang in with me for a minute. There's this scene where 
all the soldiers that came realized they were outnumbered. Now remember in Revelation, it said that the evil forces were like the sand of the sea. And they surrounded the holy city, surrounded the saints. And there's this scene in Braveheart where, where the people are, that, that are fighting for the, for the Irish at the time, right, are surrounded by the British. There's, they're, they're just look like sand on the sea, and they all want to go home. And then Braveheart, William Wallace, comes strolling on the horse, and he says, I fight and you may die. Run and you may live, at least for a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Freedom. And then you have to ask the question, what is, what is freedom worth? Now, why am I talking about this again here on this close to our, to our Christmas season? Well, I was fired up watching that movie, and I remember thinking, yes, freedom is something that you're willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice for. But there's physical freedom, and then, brothers and sisters, there's spiritual freedom. There's a spiritual bondage that the enemy wants to put us in. And the biggest reason, right off the bat, why I am not up here preaching on this particular week, though if you come back on Christmas Sunday, maybe we'll do something more festive and jolly, okay? We're not going to talk about Santa, but we'll do festive, right? But today, as we walk into that season, before that season happens, I think it's important that we know that when Jesus the King was born, somebody who was revolutionary was born into this world. Somebody who was a warrior to set captives free was born into this world. Somebody who loved you enough to set you free was born into this world. Understand this and understand this right from the beginning of this message. When Jesus came, battle lines began being formed almost immediately. It was not all the hunky-dory things that we see with all the bells and whistles and the happiness. It was oftentimes animosity that this king would be born. And the people of God, their hope prior to the Messiah being born, their hope prior to their Christmas event was that a Messiah would come and liberate them from Rome. They expected Christmas, though they wouldn't have called it at that time, they expected the birth of their Messiah to be a battle. They didn't expect presents under a tree. They didn't even go around singing, uh, you know, peace, joy, and, and all, all that stuff. They, yes, they had all those things. Yes, they had hope. But their hope was for a battle. Understand that. Because I think we miss that in the Christmas season. That the early people of God, their hope was that a battle was coming. Prior to Christmas, we have to think about hope. And maybe even think of it from that perspective, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But first we have to get number two. Actually, before we even go to number two, think about the song. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. The Christmas hope, the messianic hope, was that a people would be redeemed out of captivity. That they wouldn't be under the Persians or the Babylonians or the Assyrians. They wouldn't be under the Alexander the Great and the Greeks. They wouldn't be taken over by Rome and under Rome's wing. That they would be free. They were looking for the bravest of brave hearts. That was their Christmas hope. It's an interesting perspective on Christmas a little bit, isn't it? It's a different perspective on Christmas. What about Mary and Joseph? Here's another reason why I want to talk about this today. As Mary and Joseph awaited their baby boy, certainly they were filled with all the Christmas cheer, right? Certainly nothing would trouble them. They must have been pure excitement. But listen to Luke 2, 25 through 35. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the cons consolation of Israel, waiting for that redemption to happen. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up, takes the baby, the young child up in his arms, blessed God and say, said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples 
a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. But listen now. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul too, so that the thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. Let me say it again. The expectation on Christmas morning, the real Christmas morning, was that a warrior was going to be born. A champion was going to be born. A champion of all champions. A brave heart of all brave hearts. That was the pre-Christmas mentality. And I think it's there's something to be said, even if we only do it this year, but maybe we'll do it again, to going back to that idea, to getting that the spirit, right, when Christ was born was tense, a battle of kingdoms, right? The Jewish leader Herod, what did he do? He executed children just to get rid and try to stamp out Jesus. Right? But Mary and Joseph fled because they were warned. The arrival of the Christ child meant that babies were being executed. I know that's not fun pre-Christmas, but let's go back to the real, the real stuff that went on. Christmas was tense. A king was coming, and that meant that those in power were going to feel threatened. A troubling anticipa anticipation. Not the eagerness of toys under the tree. Number three, why well, I want to talk about this. We are also a people in waiting. I know what it's like to feel captive. I know what it's like to feel captive to sin. I know what it's like to feel captive to suffering. And I know that I'm not the only one. We are still a people who say, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. We're a people who not only need to celebrate Christmas on Christmas Sunday, but we need to look forward to the final return of Jesus Christ. You can't go to Christmas and only see the little baby boy. How many times have you heard that? I used to say, and Pastor Don used to say, you have to look through the eyes of the cross and then see the baby boy. Let's go even one step further this week, shall we? And say, you have to look to the one who's coming in the clouds to ransom us, to liberate us from evil, to, to dry every tear, to rid suffering, to rid loss, to rid grief, to rid pain. The greatest Christmas gift is still to come when he returns. He brought us salvation. Yes, and it's written down, but salvation's climax is still to come. We ought to be a people in waiting saying, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. That's what I want you to get this Christmas is let's not just say thank you for coming. Let's say, oh, come, oh, come again. I long for the time when suffering ends. I'm longing for a time when there's no more tears and there's no more loss and there's no more death and there's no more grief. I long for a time when there's no self-doubt, when there's no insecurities, when there's no addictions, when there's no self-loathing. I long for a time when all the things that people are struggling with each and every day are finally laid to rest. We, like the people of old, before Christ was born, have to be waiting for the battle. It's because the first time Jesus came, he came to give you salvation and give you the love of the Father in exchange for your heart. But when he comes again, he's coming to bring paradise with him. He's coming to bring the kingdom with him. He's coming, and you know what? I got some loved ones who are coming in with him. Let's long for the return of the king on Christmas and not just celebrate the fact that he came. Yes, next week we will do that, but I want to recapture that tense spirit before, before Christ was born. The people who were longing and begging God saying, please redeem us. Please bring redemption. Please liberate us. Please bring us freedom. I want to recapture that feeling today and hold it deep in my heart. 
And no, it's not going to be against Rome when, when he returns. No, it's not going to be against humankind. But the scripture says all evil and perpetuators of evil and the devil himself and the beast and the false prophet. It's the end of it. I don't want to be tempted anymore. I don't want to struggle just to be righteous anymore. I don't want to stumble. I don't want to hurt people with the things I say. We, I said you've got to come into this sermon not only with a spirit of, of proclamation but a spirit of confession. And hopefully by the end, we'll see a spirit of mission because we have a job to do until he comes. The battle is still raging today. And that leads me to number four. Because in between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ lies our story. Lies your story. And yours and mine. A story that's still unfolding. From Christmas morning until he comes in the clouds, there's a story of a battle, and we have a role in it, bracketed on both sides from Christmas to glory. And this is the one I want to talk about today as a people in waiting. We have to be a people prepared. Listen, when you give your life to Christ, if you don't know Christ and you're here saying, uh, that's my entry point with this whole kingdom thing and this whole Jesus thing is, I, I think I want to receive Christ. You know what? God bless you. That is a wonderful thing. But understand, understand it's not all a bed of roses. You might lose people that you love dearly because they don't want anything to do with you anymore because they don't like your faith. Not every Christmas present is wrapped in a bow. Not every Christmas present is wrapped tightly with wrapping paper. Sometimes it's the greatest gift of all, but what comes around that gift is hard to take. But you've got to have the courage to open it anyways, don't you? Not everybody loves when you make a decision for the kingdom. I can remember people thinking, what are you doing? And not for your dad. What are you doing? What is your dad instead? Come on. Come on, Ryan. We're supposed to do this, this, and this. I'm not interested in that anymore. It's amazing how many people sail down the river. But we're a people in battle, spiritually. Not in battle against them. Love them. But it's different. Right? Listen. Listen to the scripture here. I want, I want to read this to you. And they went away, and Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. This is about John the Baptist. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' house, king's houses. But then did you go out to see what? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, this is part I want you to focus in on, among those born of women there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Listen, this whole thing is being said by Jesus while John the Baptist is in prison. And he's saying, I didn't expect this. He even sends his people, go find out, is he really the one who's supposed to bring this kingdom? Because I'm in prison here. And, and Jesus, Jesus says, blessed is he who is not offended by me. But listen, Jesus was a continual threat to the status quo. Maybe you've accepted Jesus. Maybe you've received him and you're like, you know what? I got to start. I got to start picking up the the armor of faith, and I got to go out and share the love of God with people. I I feel called in my life to share the love of Jesus Christ so that people who are chained and bound, people who in the quiet depths and recesses of their heart are still saying, "Oh come, oh come, Emmanuel, and ransom me." I got to get out of this mess. My life's broken up. I can't recover. Oh come and ransom captive Israel. There's people out there saying that. And sometimes when you feel called to bring it to them, you might find a whole host of people come against you. They might even be religious people who come against you. You're not supposed to be doing that. But I feel, I feel like we've got to grab hands for the kingdom. You might find, just like Jesus and just like John the Baptist, that it's other people. Of the faith. And so you're not supposed to be doing that. You have to persevere. 
and be willing to say, I am part of the battleground. My story is still unfolding because Jesus hasn't come in the clouds yet. Jesus hasn't brought the end to suffering, so I got to bring him who can heal suffering to somebody else. You got to remember that everywhere the king went, there were battle lines being formed. John the Baptist was beheaded. They tried to kill Jesus by killing children. Everyone who prepared a path for the kingdom, Paul prepared a path for the kingdom, and he was, he was martyred. Peter prepared a path for the kingdom, and he was martyred. The disciples, the apostles, even the early church prepared a path for the kingdom, and they were martyred. Because when you say the king is coming, and I, I want to be a part of bringing them, you will inevitably be a threat to somebody else. Because people want to do it on their day. That's what, that's what they like about Jesus. But Jesus, that's not the message we wanted from our Messiah. That's not the avenue we wanted our Messiah to take. You're not doing it our way. So we got to snuff you out. See, there's a, all kinds of battle lines that form. Because people are in bondage. When you step out to do the work of the kingdom, watch out sometimes. But listen. You have to prepare yourself to persevere. James 1.25 says, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, right? The law of freedom and perseveres, being not just a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. You are called to do something for the kingdom of God, to be a warrior with the, with the bravest of the brave hearts. To be a champion with the champion. You're not called to sit back and do nothing. I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. I'm saying it to each and every one of you. We are called to bring the gift of the king on Christmas. And we are called to wait for him to come and cry out for him to come again. And I really think people need that. I think people need that. They need hope today. They need kindness. Don't let anybody tell you, you are not equipped to do the kingdom's work. You are equipped to do the kingdom's work. You are. Be involved in ministry. Be like we talked about last week, Christ's ambassadors. Partake together. Yeah, tough times can come, right? Matthew 24, right? It says that they're going to deliver you up to tribulation, right? You'll be hated by all nations for my namesakes. And many will fall away. They'll even betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Because of lawlessness will be increased. Love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And listen, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Let me paraphrase that because it's really important for where I'm going. Right? When the gospel finishes going out. And everybody who's meant to receive that gospel receives that gospel. That's when he returns. Now, in the sovereignty of God, he knows the time, and it's all ordained. But that doesn't change the fact that he asks you and me, hey, can you prepare for my arrival again? You know who we're like? Yes, John the Baptist. Oh, my John the Baptist was beheaded. You know who we're like in this? John the Baptist. Preparing the way for the Christ to come. John the Baptist 2.0. I said there'd be no updates in the kingdom. Upgrades and like iPhones with the kingdom of God, but just permit me that one. You know what? Like John the Baptist, we might ruffle feathers along the way. We might lose old people that we know along the way. But you know what? We have to get back to being missional. Remember, and I want you, I, this is a really important point, as you cannot build the foundation of, of your ministry or whatever. And I believe in the ministry that's called the priesthood of all believers. I believe that you, just because you're in the seat and I'm up here, doesn't change the fact that we minister together. It just does not change that fact. I believe that in my heart of hearts. I'll, I'll speak a little on it before, before we close, but listen, you cannot build your foundation on an enemy. You have to build it on the kingdom. 
Jesus talked a lot about Satan, didn't he? Called him the great adversary, the enemy. But he didn't build his ministry on an enemy. He built it on proclaiming the kingdom. Tell John, wait, wait a minute, John sends his guys, like I said, go ask Jesus, are you the one or not? What's going on here? I'm getting persecuted. What's happening here? Go tell John, Jesus says, that the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. He didn't build it on an enemy. He built it on the kingdom of God and our ability to encounter it, to experience it. And that's what we have to do. It's the best gift you can give Jesus is to say, listen, no matter what, I am with you in this battlefield. I will go like John the Baptist before you and prepare for that second Christmas event. John the Baptist gave Jesus the best Christmas gift. He prepared the way for him. We can do the same because it says that once the gospel goes to all the nations, then he comes back. It's the only verse, in my opinion, as I study the scriptures, the only verse that will absolutely tell you exactly when Jesus will return. When the gospel's done going out. And who does he ask to bear that gift? You and me. Nobody should say anything different. Jesus was not an anti this or an anti that he was pro healing, pro salvation, pro love, pro hope, pro faith. And I beckon you today to listen to me when I say, remember this, our battle is for the love of God, not for hatred, not for animosity, not for bitterness, not for resentment. Our battle is for the love of God. Our, the people that we're trying to save are out there. They're not always the ones in here. It's not just about coming here. It's about getting out there, is it not? Our job is to be soldiers for love's sake. If you don't believe me, look at the one we're preparing the way for. The king, the king of glory, the king of love. If you don't believe that, look at what, what Paul says the weapons that we have been given for the battle are. Listen, from 2 Corinthians, right? For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have the divine power to destroy strongholds. We're not waging war on another person. We're not waging war on somebody else. We're not, what we're waging war against is the hold that the enemy, that the devil has, that evil has on people's lives and it's crippling them. And I think they're long, I think people are out there right now saying, oh come, oh come Emmanuel and ransom. And we've been asked to be part of that battlefield. There are a variety of gifts, Paul says, but the same spirit. A variety of service. Yes, you've been listed in the service when you signed up follow Jesus. I don't know if you know that or not. Not enough. We don't preach that enough. But you enlisted in the service. Varieties of service, but the same Lord. Variety of activities, but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. What? For you personally? No. Your gift isn't for you to unwrap and play with by yourself. Your gift is given for the common good in the service of the battlefield. What are they, you might ask? What weapons have we been given? To some is an utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge by the same spirit. To some, faith, like an exorbitant amount of faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. Working of miracles, prophecy, distinguished between spirits, varieties of tongues, interpretation of these tongues. All these are empowered by the one and same spirit who apportions to each one, right? To each and every one, if you look at chapter 14, but I won't get there now, individually as he wills. Every one of you has something you've been given to be in this brigade. I said it before we started. Come out of here with a point of confession. Come out of here with a point of proclamation. But come out here with a heart of mission. 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 <clears throat> For we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all made one, all were made to drink of one spirit. So I say to you, yes, Merry Christmas. You've been given gifts under the tree. But it's not like the sit and spin where you just sit and turn around in circles. It's not the old perfection game that I love so much where the pieces you got to get in where they go, right? And every time I'd sit there as it was coming, I'd start to get nervous. And as soon as it popped in, I would always jump up about that high. It's not Simon where you can just press the, the blue and yellow and red lights by yourself. 
You didn't get that kind of gift when Christmas came, when Christ came. You got a gift to use for the common good. So use it and don't let anybody tell you not to use it. There's too much at stake. They're wielded for the kingdom who calls love its king. What did you come here for? To be a reed shaken in the wind? A man dressed in soft clothing? Truly I tell you, of those born among women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So I say, arise. Grab hands, grab the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, fasten your belt of truth, because the battlefield awaits us. And let's be before Christmas here, like the people of old before Christmas, waiting for that general to show. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, you have called us in a profound way, in a way that I think far too few in the body of Christ understand. We haven't been called to be attenders, we've been called to be participants. We've been called to do ministry, every one of us. We've been given gifts that we don't even know we had. And Lord, I'm thinking even in our, in our faith group discussions of all the great conversations that came out where we can see these gifts in each other and what a blessing that is. It encourages us. So I ask us, Lord, to, to feel and to understand your spirit as your spirit moves for us, preparing us to be like John the Baptist of old, to go out and prepare a way for you, our king. And if battles come along the way, it's okay, Lord, because you have us. You have us and you love us. You've equipped us. You've prepared us. And in the end, every tear will dry. Lord, I want to pray. I want to take a little extra time and pray for people out there right out these doors right now who don't know you. But I don't even know how I'd make it a day not knowing you. I think everybody here would say amen to that. Father, how do we even make it without you in your life? I, I know how much our faith means to us. Let us be soldiers, but not one that fight the flesh of others, of ones who bring your love. Or maybe somebody out there right now, we might, I pray, Lord, that when we walk out here, somebody in this room has a chance to encounter somebody, even as we walk out, that you've prepared. I want to see miracles happen, Lord, for you. We'll cry, O come, Emmanuel.